2021. A strange year for the history books indeed. All in one year, we saw the continued spread and propagation of the coronavirus, major political shifts across the globe, and notably, in music. It celebrated the 15th year anniversary of one of the greatest jazz albums ever released. And of course, for our special niche, 2021 saw the release of arguably one of the most important CPU launches in recent history. Now, this video is far from an Otter Lake retrospective, but this release was and is more important than people give credit for, or even seem to remember. Only three short years ago, the tech press were saying things like this. There was a lot of excitement, and for good reason. The introduction of a heterogeneous architecture on desktop had a lot of potential to be something great. The thought of intelligent power and efficiency management akin to mobile? That held great promise in the land of rising electricity and platform costs. Though, that's not exactly what we got. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. What even is a heterogeneous architecture? What exactly do they do? How many times will I say heterogeneous in this video? Well, 20 times, to be exact. Simply put, it's a design where not all cores are created equal. Instead, you have a combo of powerful, high-performance cores and energy-efficient cores working together. Think of it as different types of processors being combined within a single system. These architectures enable better handling of multitasking, improved battery life, and enhanced overall system efficiency by leveraging the different strengths and core types within a single platform. The most common type of device using this technology is cell phones, though they weren't the first. For a second, I want to look back, and no, not to Alder Lake, but decades before its launch. Let us appreciate what laid the groundwork for what we have now. The 1990s saw the rise of embedded systems, devices that required efficient and specialized processing for tasks like signal processing, graphics rendering, and control functions. At this time, engineers began integrating specialized processors or coprocessors alongside general purpose CPUs. These early heterogeneous systems were mainly used in embedded applications, such as automotive control units and mobile devices where power efficiency and real-time processing were critical. One of the earliest forms of heterogeneous computing was the use of digital signal processors, or DSPs, alongside general purpose CPU in embedded systems. DSPs were designed to handle tasks like audio processing or real-time data analysis more efficiently than a traditional CPU could. In fact, one of the first commercially successful examples of a heterogeneous processor was Texas Instruments OMAP, Introduced in 1993, it stands for Open Multimedia Application Platform. These chips combined a general purpose ARM CPU with the DSP, specifically tailored for mobile multimedia applications. The OMAP series became a foundation for many early smartphones, offering a balance between power efficiency and processing capability. And this was only the beginning. As we all know, this era saw an explosion in mobile device usage, which led to a surge of demand for more powerful, yet energy-efficient processors. As consumers demanded more from the devices, like better graphics, faster internet browsing, and seamless multimedia playback, chip designers realized that a single type of processor couldn't handle all tasks efficiently. This realization drove the adoption of heterogeneous architectures, where different processing units were integrated to handle specific tasks more effectively. Which brings us to the intention of design. In traditional CPU designs, all cores are symmetric or homogeneous. They have the same performance and energy consumption profiles. On a Ryzen 5950X, Core 0 typically will perform within a close spec of Core 13. But with big little architectures, CPUs from the likes of ARM and Intel will mix powerful performance-oriented big cores with energy-efficient little cores, as to have a bit of a moving target on the overall performance profile. Core 0 on a 12700K is vastly different from Core 16 on the same chip. Now, most people in tune with the enthusiast space know this though. Big cores do the big tasks, little cores do the lighter stuff. Nothing I'm saying is secret knowledge. Though, where the waters get muddied is with implementation of the architecture. How ARM and Intel approach the architecture vastly different from each other, and a lot of that is attributed to the different ISAs. 
said it. He said it. ISAs or instruction set architectures have strangely become another battleground, so to speak, in the tech space. A war of culture, if you will. I see so much discourse about ARM versus x86, how Apple's M series silicon has destroyed x86 due to ARM just being more efficient, if you will. Then you have x86 people countering that the larger instruction sets of their platform makes them better because it allows for more programs to run natively. And then someone jumps in talking about risk versus CISC and it all goes to hell in a handbasket. The terms to me have nearly lost all meaning due to the nuance of the situation being beaten out. I mean, real talk, ARM hasn't been risk in a while. In ARM v8, once you count vector instructions, extensions, etc., it's close to a thousand instructions, sometimes over that. For reference, the Haswell microarchitecture supported 2,034 instructions. Sure, that's more than a thousand for a general ARM processor, but that's nothing like a few hundred of a RISC-V one. My point being, we really need to dissect the difference between these terms if we're going to truly understand why big little matters. We need to know what an instruction set is and is not. I know you like to use a laptop. What are the key features that you think should be in the ideal laptop? Well, I really enjoy the portability of the laptop, that's for sure. And that, that means it's got to be lightweight. Uh, it has to have an internal hard disk drive, you know, which is floppies, and a paper white display that's backlit. Now, the only problem we have to solve is that battery problem. I right. think, you know, you take that trip to San Francisco to New York and you start hearing the beep beep over Denver. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but we're heading that way. Uh, battery technology is better, and I brought along a little toy here. This is the, a two and a half inch hard disk drive. An instruction set architecture is essentially the bridge between software and hardware. It defines the set of instructions that a processor can execute, including basic operations like arithmetic, data handling, and control instructions. The ISA is crucial because it determines how software communicates with the processor, dictating what operations the hardware can perform and how. So some key points. What an ISA is. It's a set of instructions that the CPU can understand and execute. It's also the interface between the software, like your operating system and applications, as well as the CPU hardware itself. Now, what an ISA is not, it's not the physical hardware or design of the CPU itself. People often get that confused. It also does not dictate how the processor is built, only how it should behave in response to software instructions. ISAs can generally be categorized into two philosophies. RISC or Reduced Instruction Set Computer, and CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computer. These terms describe different approaches to designing the instruction set and how a CPU processes instructions. RISC architectures, like those used by ARM, focus on a small, highly optimized set of instructions. The idea is to execute each instruction quickly, often in a single clock cycle, by keeping the instruction simple and uniform. This allows for faster processing and easier pipelining, which is the technique of executing multiple instructions simultaneously. This does not make ARM processors inherently more efficient than x86 ones. On the other hand, CISC architectures like x86 include a broader set of instructions, some of which can execute complex tasks in a single instruction. This approach was designed to reduce the number of instructions per program, which made sense when memory was expensive and very slow. Some key characteristics, more complex instructions, some performing multiple operations, variable instruction length, and designed to reduce the number of instructions per program. The x86 ISA used in most desktop and laptop computers is a very well known example of CISC. It's highly flexible and powerful, but often at the cost of increased complexity and power consumption. Again, this does not mean one ISA is more efficient than the other one. Processors are designed much more holistically than they were in the 90s. A lot more goes into how efficient an SOC is beyond if it's RISC or CISC. You can have an efficient x86 SOC, like Intel's Tiger Lake or the recent Lunar Lake chips, and you can have inefficient ARM ones. I'm looking at you, Snapdragon 888 and 8 Gen 1. Like I just mentioned, processor design is a much more involved affair than just choosing whether to go ARM and what node to target. Modern CPUs often blend these concepts to get the best of both worlds. I won't get into this video, but briefly, I can confidently tell you that a processor's efficiency is determined by more than just ISA. The main ones are microarchitecture, manufacturing process, 
PMT, or power management techniques, and the unsung hero of efficiency, good old software optimization, which actually is a wonderful segue into my next point. We've gone over the history, talked about the ISAs, and even dabbled in philosophy regarding architectural design, though all of that is null and void if the operating system scheduler has no idea how to use cores like these. The OS needs to intelligently decide which task goes to which core. If a demanding gamer application gets assigned to the little cores, well, then performance tanks. Similarly, if light background tasks occupy big cores, then you're just wasting power. Modern OS schedulers have evolved to optimize this process, but they're not perfect. And that's where performance inconsistencies can arise. I can't help but look at the recent Zen 5 launch debacle and the inconsistent performance that came from that. Beyond the mishandling of marketing, beyond the misleading benchmarks, what it really came down to was some sort of scheduling issue, or so I believe at this time I'm recording. Now, scheduling CCXs and hybrid cores is apples to orange, but the comparison serves us well enough. If your locking mechanisms aren't doing their job, then your entire system is FUBAR. Oh yeah, locks. Let's talk about those now. 20% faster than the linear menus and about half the error rate. In that study, the results showed a rather consistent pattern uh, where the pie menus took selection times of approximately one second, whereas the linear menus ranged from about uh, almost two seconds to about two and a half seconds. In computing, locks are mechanisms that control access to shared resources in a multi-core system ensuring that only one core can access a critical section of code at a time. This is crucial to avoid conflicts and ensure data consistency. The Big Little architecture introduces a challenge for traditional locking mechanisms because these systems have heterogeneous cores with different performance capabilities. So, what are some traditional locking mechanisms? Well, you have FIFO, or First In, First Out locks. It's a basic locking mechanism where the first core to request access to a critical section is the first to receive it. In a homogeneous system, where all cores are the same, FIFO locks work really well. However, in a hybrid system, they can lead to inefficiencies because they don't account for the different speeds of the big and little cores. For example, a little core might get access before a big core, causing a performance bottleneck, like an E-core performing a game's shader compilation instead of a P-core. Then you have spin locks type of lock where a core continuously checks if a lock is available, or spins, until it can acquire it. This is particularly inefficient in big little systems because little cores might waste time spinning while a big core could complete the task much faster. Now on to some great news for hybrid architectures. We now have Core Aware Locks, or CAL. CALs are more sophisticated locking mechanism designed specifically for heterogeneous systems like Big Little. CAL takes into account the type of core when managing locks. It gives priority to big cores where appropriate, optimizing overall system performance. CAL can dynamically adjust how locks are managed based on the current workload and the type of cores available, improving both efficiency and fairness in resource allocation. So some benefits. Fairness. CAL ensures that both big and little cores get fair access to resources preventing scenarios where big cores are unnecessarily delayed by little cores. Then you have throughput. By prioritizing big cores when necessary, CAL improves the overall throughput of the system, meaning more tasks are completed in less time. And of course, adaptability. CAL can adapt to different types of workloads and system configurations, making it versatile solution for various big little implementations. Studies from Dr. Xia Kuang Mie and Yingming Liu of Zhaotong University show that coreware locks improve fairness by up to 67% and throughput by over 26% compared to traditional locking algorithms. This essentially means a clearer balancing of the core types and their assigned workloads. These improvements aren't just theoretical either. In real-world applications like LevelDB, using a core-aware approach boosts performance, reduces latency, and ensures smoother operation across both big and little cores. As CPUs continue to evolve, this kind of optimization will be key in getting the most out of mixed core architectures. From PC to internet to 
to IoT, to mobile, to cloud, and now to Gen AI. And as we all know, ARM is a global leading semiconductor IP and compute platform provider, powering many devices globally. Well, we're into the waning of 2024. At this point in the year, we've seen the release of Qualcomm Snapdragon X Elite, Intel's Lunar Lake is slowly trickling out, and of course, AMD's Ryzen AI series. But where do we go from here? What's next? Well, we can be sure that all major chip makers will continue pushing for this style of SOC. We'll see Arrow Lake release, Snapdragon 8 Gen 4, and of course, Apple's M4 in their MacBooks. But what's beyond just consumer product releases? Big Little, Homogenous, x86, ARM, etc, etc, etc. Why should any of us care going forward? And that's an honest question. If your x86 laptop had the same efficiency and battery life as a MacBook, would you care about what ISC8 used? I don't think so. There has to be more beyond the marketing. And indeed there is. The true innovation isn't just about which architecture reigns supreme or what ISA is under the hood. It's about how these technologies are converging to deliver experiences that were once thought of as impossible. It's about the evolution of heterogeneous computing, where CPUs, GPUs, and specialized processors work together in harmony, and the advancements in software optimization that will leverage this new hardware in ways we're only beginning to imagine. Looking forward, the battle won't be about RISC versus CISC or ARM versus x86. It's going to be about who can deliver the most compelling and efficient computing experience, regardless of the underlying architecture. As AI continues to play a more significant role in our devices, and as workloads become more diverse and complex, the lines between these architectures will blur even further, I believe. So, what's next? It's a future where distinctions we've held on to for so long, x86, ARM, RISC, 6 they matter less and less. It's a future driven by innovation and efficiency and the relentless pursuit of better user experiences. And as consumers, that's what we should care about. Not the architecture itself, but how it makes our daily lives better and how it makes technology more accessible in the end. Again, it's not about the ISA. It's about what it enables and where the real excitement lies. I am the Silicon Fox, and I thank you for watching.